for me, I have come to realize that, you know, there's a commitment to participate in a political process through your vote and allowing your vote to be your voice and your voice to be your vote. And for me as an African American, this has not always been the case. It has not always been the case. And it wasn't until the 15 amendments that the African Americans were given the right to vote. It wasn't until the 15 amendments that African American men were given the right to vote. And that was passed February the 26, 1869, and was ratified on February 3, 1870. But along with that ability to have a voice, to participate in the political process, to have a voice around policies and the way you see yourself as being a part of that commitment to um, a state, to a country that you are a part of didn't happen so easily. Because what happened when African American men were given the right to vote, immediately you had the southern states say, no, we don't think that they should be participating in this process. So what they did was that they began to introduce poll taxes. And so what happened, um, Let's start with, like, Mississippi. The Mississippi Constitu Constitutional Convention of 1890, they passed an amendment to the 15th Amendment. They passed an amendment that imposed a poll tax of $2. Now, we look back into the 1870s in African-American men and whether or not they were able to hold jobs, whether or not they were, if they had $2, there was $2 was huge. It was a poll tax that African Americans in large number could not pay. And if they could not pay that $2, what that meant was they could not vote. Part of that, it is included, it's excluded voters convicted of bribery, burglary, theft, arson, perjury, murder, uh, bigamy. We know what bigamy was, right? Okay, and also barred all who could not read any section of the state constitution. And we know African Americans do not have the right to read or learn or be educated. And so I'm not trying to condone any of the, big, um, the bribery or the theft or the archery or the perjury, but when you are en enslaved, when you do not have what it takes for your family to be fed, to survive. In larger numbers, African Americans were, were doing what they needed to do to survive everyday lives. So they had records. So there were amendments put on to say, if you, pretty much like we're doing today in the 21st century, but if you commit any of these crimes, your voice and your vote will be lost in the process. In 1895, South Carolina, they followed with similar restrictions, including a requirement that voters own property worth at least, that a voter had to own property of at least $300. And if you did not own property, you know what? You could not vote. In addition, South Carolina required that special ballots and boxes be placed in every polling place for each office of the ballot, and that voters must put their ballots in the correct box for their vote to be counted. Now, those, were the, those are some of the things that were put in place that would prevent African Americans from voting. So they say, well, you know what? What we want to do is we want to ensure that we are disenfranchising African-American men from voting, but we still want poor whites who may fall into some of those criteria to have the ability to vote. So this is what they've done. 
Louisiana introduced the innovation of the grandfather clause. So in 1889, the Louisiana Constitution was amended, amended to provide that all persons would meet, would have to meet educational and property requirements. They wouldn't have to meet that. They would have to meet it unless their fathers or grandfathers were qualified to vote on January the 1, 1867. And of course, no African Americans met that requirement. So by 1910, African Americans had been, by, by 1910, African Americans had been disenfranchised through constitutional amendments in many, many states. So I just give you a small history of what has happened to disenfranchise people or suppress a vote. This was back in the 1800s. Here we are in 2011, the 21st century. And here we are, there is, we, we heard from many of, of the people on this aisle that this is not a problem. The problem of people voting when they could is so minute that it doesn't even count. It doesn't count. So there isn't a problem. But here we are today in this chamber talking about the integrity of the process. And I am truly appalled with the integrity of this process. They just didn't start with the thought of writing this bill, but the process through conference committee and going, going forward. Here we are today speaking on the integrity of the voting process, which in my mind is not so much about the integrity of the voting process, but how do we disenfranchise a group of people? How do we suppress their vote, their voice, so that they, certain populations, are not participating in a political process. And so, as we go through this little history of how we have, lose, how we have used laws, policies, how we have amended laws and policies to benefit some, why we disenfranchise others, I just ask you to take a walk down that history of what we do in the name of righteousness, in the name of creating, in my opinion, a more fair, a more equitable laws that is about ensuring that every person, every person in the state of Minnesota has the right has the right, it is not a privilege, it is a right to vote and have their voice heard without the poll taxes being placed on certain populations and individuals. And right now, we have a $5 billion deficit that we are trying to work through. And this bill does nothing for that, absolutely nothing to create jobs, to balance a budget, and to get the people back to working. And so I just ask members to just join me in ensuring that we are not creating barriers, we are not creating more poll taxes, and that we are not disenfranchising not one person for allowing their voice to be heard. Thank you.